So again, welcome everyone who's just joined. If, um, if you've just come in, uh, you will see a survey in the chat, which we really appreciate you filling out. And um, I would now just like to officially welcome you all to the first of six masterclasses that are going to be taking place throughout October. These will be facilitated by Willis Towers Watson's Climate and Resilience Hub and will be supported by Forum for the Future. These are funded by the Lauders Foundation. I'm Charlene Collison from Forum for the Future. Hello. You might notice that on joining this masterclass, um, all the delegates have been muted, but we do encourage you to add questions that you'd like to ask in the Q&A session. And we'd like to make you aware that the session will be recorded. You can activate the Q&A panel by clicking in the bottom right corner of your window, um, clicking the three dots, or it may say Q&A, um, and select Q&A. So let's go ahead and dive in. So we know that the entire cotton value chain, from producers and processors to brands and retailers or traders in between, um, everyone is facing increasing, increasing exposure to climate risks. And at the same time, the sector itself can also contribute to climate change. If it's going to thrive in an increasingly climate disrupted world, the cotton sector and the wider textiles industry require radical change, and this can only be achieved through sector-wide collaboration. Thanks to the support of the Laudas Foundation, Cotton 2040 has been working over the past five years on a mission to encourage dialogue, alignment, and collaboration to help facilitate the shift to a sustainable global cotton industry. So we'd like to begin then with some opening words from our funders. And just note, if a Windows uh, pop-up appears in front of the screen, just press cancel to make it go away. So, over to the Laudas Foundation. Welcome to the Cotton 2040 Masterclass Series. Cotton 2040 was created in 2017 to advocate for a fair and sustainable cotton industry. It brings together various stakeholders in the value chain, international brands and retailers, sustainable cotton standards, traders, processors, and most importantly, farmers. One of the key work streams under Cotton 2040 is to help stakeholders understand and prepare for climate change impacts on natural fibers such as cotton. Farmers, who are the most important stakeholder for production, are also the most vulnerable to climate risks and extreme weather events like droughts, heat waves, and floods. And this then is a threat for the whole industry. This has also been highlighted in the first ever global analysis of climate risks to cotton growing regions conducted by Cotton 2040. We have a very recent example of what happened in Pakistan, where 40 to 45 percent of the cotton crop was submerged on account of flooding in the country. In India, similarly, heavy rains and pests have cut cotton production. In other cotton growing geographies like China, Brazil and the US, heat waves and droughts are ravaging farms and are set to drag production to the lowest levels. Therefore, it is important that all stakeholders need to work together to find solutions collectively. I do hope you find these sessions helpful and each one of you will be able to take back something and support your organizations in contributing towards addressing the climate change risks. Through October, we'll be hosting a series of six masterclasses and we'll be covering a range of cutting edge climate topics that are tailored for the cotton industry so that we can build a better understanding and help uh, brands build the capacities to embed adaptation into their strategies and targets. And today, we're going to be focusing on physical climate risk in the cotton value chain. So I'm really delighted to introduce uh, our guest speaker we have with us today Hamad Naki Khan, who is the Director General of WWF of Pakistan. Uh, and having gained over 30 years of experience and expertise in the fields of environmental conservation and sustainable development, uh, he has worked on a range of national and global initiatives on climate change, nature conservation, and sustainable livelihoods. So welcome, Hamad. We're delighted to have you with us. 
And we've all seen the disaster that has hit Pakistan in recent months. Please tell us a little bit about the current situation on the ground and the impact that we're starting to see on supply chains of cotton and their manufacturing outputs. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene, for the nice uh, introduction. So, um, firstly, I'm honored and humbled to be present in this first uh, masterclass on a, on a topic which is very close to my heart. Assalamu alaikum, good morning, good afternoon, uh, all, the, all the participants. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Pakistan has witnessed one of the, the worst natural disaster in its history. Uh, we are a, you know, country which is like, you know, like literally countries, floodplains, but we have never, you know, uh, seen such a catastrophe. Um, we are at the moment ground zero of uh, climate change impact. Maybe we are the first country, but we are not the last country. Um, the thing is that uh, cotton for Pakistan is very important. We, we are the fifth largest cotton producer. Uh, the major industrial sector is textile, and we export the value-added textile articles to the leading global brands and retailers. What is the situation right now? One third of the country is underwater. There are, are more than you know 1,600 people who lost their lives. Uh, around 400,000 houses they were damaged. Uh, they were. Uh, almost almost more than 800,000 livestock which literally were were, were lost 2 million uh, you know 2 million acres of crops uh, you know they just they just were washed away and i think as all, uh, Nita also mentioned 40% of 40 to 50% of the the cotton which is gone Yes, uh, you know, if you look at our contribution towards, the, you know, the greenhouse gas emission is less than 1%. So we are at the receiving end. We are one of those countries which are one of the most vulnerable and without our fault are facing the, 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 the music. Uh, so I think it's very important that treating Pakistan as a case for, for loss and damage, but also, uh, you know, as a, as a case study to assess the risks associated to you know the global supply chains just because of uh, climate change i mean i know the, particularly the cotton and textile supply chain is uh, is very fragmented it's it's a long supply chain but and there are other challenges but now we have seen that how the climate change can disrupt and literally uh, have a severe impact on uh, you know on 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 this supply chain so uh, i think i'll i'll, I'll stop here but maybe uh, the, the other challenges and the, the maybe the things which needs to be done, we can cover later. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think, Erin, I hand over to you. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Hamad. Thank you for sharing your experience. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Erin Noah. I'm the project manager for WCW on Cost Intensive 40. So as one of the world's most important natural fibres, a critical means of livelihood for millions around the globe. What does the future hold for the cotton value chain as we face decades of change to our climate system? How will claim, uh, climate change impact cotton production? Next slide, please. So we all know that the global temperatures are increasing. The climate around us is changing from more frequent flooding events to more severe wildfires, to stronger winds, to changes in rainfall patterns. Headline news that we're all somewhat a little too familiar with by now. But how will the climate change, how will the climate change over the coming years? The pathway that we as a global society take over the coming years is uncertain. Nobody has a crystal ball. So we have to play with different scenarios, different possibilities, different stories. These stories are put into climate models by our scientists models which have been built to mimic the global climate system and these are the best tools that we currently have to look into the future we are currently on the worst or the near worst case trajectory and showing no apparent sign of decreasing our global emissions this is not an ideal storyline while we do have targets and pledges in place 
And you may have heard of the Paris Agreement to reduce global emissions to net zero by 2050. We are not currently aligned with this target. So we need to prepare and we need to prepare now for the changes ahead. We must change, take measures to adapt today to mitigate the impact of future climate risk to the cotton value chain. For the apparel sector then, enhancing supply chain resilience is vital in the face of future climatic changes. Next slide, please. As briefly mentioned then by Anita Chester from the Loudest Foundation earlier in the video, through the Cotton 2040 initiative, the world's first globally consistent comprehensive study was published, looking at the impacts of climate change on the global cotton production. This was done in collaboration with a group of stakeholders from across the value chain. Using the climate models and the storylines that I mentioned earlier, we looked at physical risk to cotton from different hazards, so heat stress, drought, wildfires, changes in rainfall, flooding, and so forth, focusing then on the 2040s. Let's look a little bit deeper then at the results of that study. Next slide, please. Here we show the results of all the hazards then stacked on top of each other. So imagine a layered cake type approach to show the cotton growing regions most at risk by the 2040s under a worst case storyline. By using tools such as this one, the Cotton Explorer tool, which is available on the WTW Cotton 2040 project website, we can identify which locations within cotton growing regions across the world are at risk by 2040. But how do we work out what is driving the risk? What is the main climate hazard driving the risk at that particular location? Let's look then at a single layer in that stacked cake in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Here we show how Northern Sudan and Egypt and the Middle East stand out. And this indicator that we can see here is for heat stress. And we can see those particular regions stand out quite sharply, don't they, upon in looking at it quickly like this. Um, this is one example for one hazard, and we can do this for multiple other hazards. This approach then can be used to identify which locations within cotton growing regions across the world are at greatest risks from what hazards by the 2040. Knowing this, the location and the type of hazard can help you, as brands and retailers, take appropriate action to increase the resiliency of your supply chain. Knowing this is the first step in assessing climate risk. As a brand or retailer, uh, assessing your climate risk, sourcing your cotton possibly from a region of high risk, according to this map here. You may choose to implement or encourage others in the supply chain to take measures to mitigate the risk from heat stress. For example, by supporting initiatives with, which work with local farmers to increase sustainable irrigation methods, increasing the climate resiliency of the cotton grown in these locations. This key clearing approach allows you to, to identify what hazard is driving risk at a particular location, enabling you to implement appropriate adaptation options through a climate lens. So for brands and retailers like yourself who wish to increase climate resilience across the cotton value chain, traceability within your supply chain is a vital first step. Next slide, please. So some of the key take home messages then. By 2040, half of the world's cotton growing regions will face drastic exposure to high temperatures, changes in water availability and extreme weather events. We can also see that the world's six highest cotton producing countries, India, USA, China, Brazil, Pakistan, in Turkey, which account for 80% of the world's cotton growing regions, are all exposed to increasing climate risk. 
especially then by wildfire, drought and extreme rainfall. And on the right hand side, we can quickly pick out then that the heat stress, drought and damaging wind speeds are all key drivers of risk um, impacting the predominant uh, cotton growing regions across the world. Next slide, please. So, I mean, I think what we can see from Erin's uh, presentation here is that clearly no cotton growing area will be unaffected by climate change. You know, extreme and compounding weather conditions, such as those currently seen in Pakistan, impact the entire supply chain. A farmer might be able to survive if a field of cotton is flooded once a year. But what about twice? What about three times within a season? Year after year, it may be a different story. A recent study projected that at least five, five percentage uh, loss of the volume of cotton may be available in uh, international markets by the 2040s. This equates to well in excess of 1.2 million tonnes of cotton. And this may be a conservative figure around the loss. Climate change can also have impacts on the quality of cotton. We saw this in September as cotton prices escalated in India as a result of unseasonal rains, followed by pink bollworm attack, a type of pest that those unfamiliar with this uh, might have heard of, um, that affect uh, the crop's quality. Climate change will impact production, that's volumes available within the market, and the uh, quantity. These physical risks and impacts to cotton production uh, are you know, very profound, but is understanding these physical risks enough? Well, it's not. By focusing only on the physical risks, we're only looking essentially at one third of what defines climate vulnerability. Resiliency is not solely defined by physical risk. There's another part of the story. And so what we'll do now is to move on and complete that actual story. So, Yes, when we're thinking about physical impacts of climate change on the growing of cotton, it's essentially not enough to just look particularly at uh, the physical risks. The other really important dimension is the socio-economic and environmental factors that essentially comprise two thirds of what defines vulnerability. These are essential components of vulnerability and must be assessed hand in hand with the physical risks. Why do we do this? Because without a holistic picture, brands and retailers could be missing multiple opportunities, some of which could be easy to implement to build resilient supply chains. Next slide, please. We've completed over a year's research into the connection between climate vulnerability and communities, workers and individuals engaged in cotton production and cotton textile manufacturing. We've done this in one of the world's largest cotton producing countries, India. This study into the social, economic and environmental dimensions of climate change in the cotton context of cotton production and manufacturing is now provided in two reports, a full comprehensive report and an executive summary. These documents provide methods and district by district insights for three states in India why three states? Because these are the crucial ones within India in terms of national output. We covered two stages of the value chain within our research, rural agricultural communities and urban manufacturing communities engaged up to the pre-garment manufacturing stage. We identified 41 indicators uh, through an extensive piece of research that took over six months to complete, reviewing hundreds of scientific papers an engagement with key expert stakeholders from the Cotton 2040 Working Group. Next slide, please. Now, this map shows the three states in India we researched and the many districts where we assessed the social, economic and environmental dimensions of climate change. For rural and urban communities engaged in cotton production and manufacturing, the key drivers or underlying cause of climate vulnerability vary greatly from one district to another. What is evident here is that approaches to building resilience requires good understanding of the location of production or manufacturing. 
one district can have a very different can have very different different characteristics of vulnerability to another a broad brush approach to understanding vulnerability will not be effective next slide please thank you so let's have a look at the results we can see here on the slide on the table on the left hand side that some of the key socio-economic environmental dimensions are listed we essentially have two columns here on the left hand side we have a column that looks at rural agricultural communities on the right hand side would have the urban manufacturing ones we can see that three key aspects low wages for both male and female cotton growers and manufacturers access to finance and other banking services and low levels of, of, of technology and access to information are common across both agricultural and urban settings. Mm -hmm. Then we can see that in addition to those from in terms of agricultural communities, reliance on rain fed cotton instead of irrigation, poor quality soil, and low organic uh, carbon within the soil and high gender pay gap that continue to uh, to contribute to climate vulnerability in the urban context, low urban work, uh, participation rates, low urban male and female literacy rates, and access to water, sanitation and hygiene are all absolutely crucial aspects uh, when it comes to urban uh, climate vulnerability. So what can brands and retailers do? Well, there's an opportunity for brands and retailers to build climate resilience by understanding more about the key social economic and environmental drivers behind supply chain risk. Brands and retailers can support reductions in community vulnerability that affect producers and manufacturers by implementing programs or arguably, and more importantly, weaving climate risk management into current plans and programs that you may already have in place that address wider sustainability and social livelihood objectives. It's all connected. Addressing climate change risk is not a separate activity. The most successful outcomes integrate climate change considerations with other wider corporate social responsibility programs, whether those relate to water and sanitation, education, environment, livelihoods and social justice. So let's now turn to Hamad again. Um, hi, Hamad. Um, I've just got a question for you. Maybe you could just sort of draw out on your, your particular experience when it comes to, to these kind of uh, key drivers. So, yeah, what examples in Pakistan or elsewhere have you seen that address these sorts of socioeconomic issues as a way of building climate resilience? Okay, uh, thank you, Alistair. I think, uh, I mean, this is uh, something which I've been doing before uh, I joined uh, uh, WWF as the chief executive in 2014, I was the, the global cotton textile lead for WWF network. So in that capacity, I interacted with the leading brands and retailers to convince them to map their supply chain first, because that was very important, as you mentioned, traceability and mapping of supply chains, because a lot of them, in fact, most of them, they even didn't know. They just knew that, okay, we take these articles from this manufacturer. But going beyond, you know, upstream of that manufacturer, most uh, uh, brand and retailers were, of, were not aware of that. And then secondly, as a, as a founder of Better Cotton Initiative, which is a sustainability standard, you know, for cotton, I think convincing brand and retailers that why it's important to invest in farmers capacity building, the farmer support program in general, and particularly supporting the small scale farmers. Coming again to, you know, to, to, your, to your question, but let me also add few things which are maybe, you know, in the Indian study, maybe they're not very, uh, you know, come obvious. The, 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 I mean, for a country like Pakistan, to give you one example, where we have a monocrop economy, A. So the economy kind of, literally depends on one commodity, which is cotton and textile. You have a good crop, the economy, the GDP is fine. Uh, the industry is happy, the farmers are happy, and the entire supply chain is happy. So let's also keep that in mind. Secondly, climate change is not about natural, you know, such floods or droughts. There are also 
commodity specific risk. And a lot of these risks, they are not just reputational risk or environmental risk. Uh, they are also business risk. So I think the brand and retailers, because they rely on a commodity which is loved by a majority of uh, global population. I mean, um, so let's let's also keep that in mind. So uh, cotton is vulnerable to to pest attacks. So we have seen that because these pest attacks or you know uh, the scenarios, the time of occurrence, the changing minor pest becoming a major threat. They are also changing and we are witnessing this in many geographies. Then um, it's not just rain. There are also drought cycles and we've seen that in many geographies, even China, the southwestern China, Texas in USA, Brazil. Uh, we, we have seen that uh, the inaccessibility of farmers to early warning system and then also inadequate research on varieties which are more kind of a climate resilient, you know, either they are uh, heat, you know, uh, resistant varieties, which maybe consume less water. So let's also keep that in mind. Now, coming to this, I think there are a few things the which are common in many developing countries. Low wages, yes, it's a it's something which has to be addressed. Access to finance, particularly microcredit for small farmers, I think that's very important. The technology, and it's not just the the you know the agriculture technology. I think the information, the right information at the right time. I think that's also very key. We we found out you know in Pakistan's case that the early warning system, the forecasting system, also was not able to literally warn the the small cotton producers in a timely manner, and that's the reason that they literally literally lost you know uh, everything. And coming to finance, I think one thing which I mean, the, a lot of leading brand and retailers, they are already investing in farmer support program, either through their organic cotton program, their sustainable cotton program, as part of their CSR, they're doing, but still, uh, I mean, much needs to be done. One thing which is missing, that as part of the sustainability program, whether it's better cotton initiative or organic cotton or fair trade or cotton made in Africa, we have seen that crop insurance uh, is not there. So a lot of times, you know, the farmers, uh, you know, they get educated, they follow the system, uh, but certainly, you know, either because of drought or uh, floods or, you know, the pest attack, if they lose the crop, there is not kind of a system which can offset that damage. So I think that's also uh, very important. You talked about the vulnerability, vulnerability mapping, uh, because there are now there are areas which are where they, where water stressed areas and cotton is a kind of a, a crop which requires a lot of water, particularly in the irrigated cotton. I mean, Pakistan, all cotton is irrigated cotton. So I think that's also very important that to make a decision with their supply chain that to to support cotton programs, which are not, you know, being implemented in, in water stressed area. So uh, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, few things uh, which are important. As I said earlier, that uh, I mean, the, the, the support which was provided by IKEA initially uh, in our cotton uh, sustainable cotton program was phenomenal. And then for organic uh, cotton, the support provided by Lotus Foundation and CNA Foundation. So that's where the, the brand and retailers took, provided the leadership, leadership in not only, you know, and then a lot of these brands, they were not just, okay, take this money and do whatever you want. They employed people, they made their feet dirty. So they, they, they used to visit the field. They used to interact with the cotton growers. They want to get the first hand knowledge because they wanted to know, okay, these are the growers who are growing cotton, which is very important for our businesses. So I think that was the missing link uh, initially, but I'm, you know, but through such programs, that link was, or, or that gap was also filled. Thank you. Great, Hamid. That's that's great. Wonderful. Um, okay, let's move on to the last final slide. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, so what are some of the key take home messages from our research? Well, one of the obvious ones that Erin opened with is around the fact that there is a shortfall of 
potentially millions of tons of cotton globally, which are resulting from particularly high temperatures, but also changes in water availability, extreme weather events by the 2040s. And of course, we've mapped that. And we have our Cotton Explorer tool, which you're all able to access for free to, to have a look at this by the WTW's Cotton 2040 website. Um, as Hamad reiterated, uh, traceability in the supply chain is a vital step. Um, much of our work with various brands and retailers around the world, this traceability is a critical issue. Um, and it really enables us to be able to hone down into the, the locations because physical climate risk, the sort of impacts we've been talking about are so site specific, so location specific, that really understanding that traceability even if it's though just down to a, you know, maybe a state, but a district level or something, it doesn't have to be necessarily pinpoint, but getting as, as, as um, granular, granular as possible is really important there. Building resilience, it's not just about physical risks. I think hopefully through the study and some of our reports, which again, you've got free access to, understanding that these social, economic and environmental dimensions are in fact two thirds of the way that we have to think about this holistically. It's not all about the hazard, about whether we're in a flood zone or not, or, or et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, a just transition to a climate compatible, low carbon, a resilient supply chain needs collaborative action. It's essential. I mean, through this work and much of our other work um, globally in this, this kind of field, collaboration with stakeholders, with local government, you know, they all hold the keys to a collective solution here. Linking grassroots initiatives, which we've been really focusing on today, um, with corporate governance is another vital piece. And I'll draw your attention to Masterclass 4, which will be coming up next week, where we'll be actually looking at climate in the context of governance and how those pieces come together. And we've got a set of great experts on that that will be speaking particularly to that point. And finally, I think this point that you know, climate change is not a separate issue. It actually can be integrated very much in the way that you're already trying to achieve lots of sustainability, livelihoods, et cetera, type of goals. But that actually integrating some of these considerations around climate can be actually relatively light touch, but actually can really enhance some of the programs that you have in place. That's an essential point and, and certainly a key take home from this presentation. OK, thank you very much. I'll, I'll end there and pass back over to Charlene. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alistair. And to all our speakers, uh, Aaron and uh, Hamad, uh, very, um, very wonderful and, and particularly from Hamad, a very passionate um, perspective. So a reminder that both reports, the global analysis and the India assessment um, and the uh, executive summaries which accompany those are available on the Willis Towers Watson website. Um, they're free to download. And I would really highly recommend that you have a look at the website um, after the webinar. Uh, you won't just find the reports. There are other materials, other resources available on climate risks to the cotton value chain, um, including an interactive map of risks uh, to the global cotton growing regions. It's a, it's a wonderful map where you can zoom in on areas you're particularly interested in and look at them across a range of risks. So if you want to uh, learn more about Cotton 2040, please contact my colleague Hannah Kinney from Forum for the Future. And if you'd like to learn more about the topics discussed today, if you need further guidance on what your next steps as a company along your climate journey are, then please contact Alistair Bagley or Erin Owen. So we are now going into the Q&A portion of the session. And we have had some very interesting questions coming into the chat. And uh, I, I'd like to start with a question um, that has come through around, how can we recognize and escalate the importance of biodiversity and nature-based solutions in tackling climate change? Great. Well, um, maybe I can start on that and, and, and see where we get to. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, historically, ecosystems have been poorly valued, haven't they, by society. It's the tragedy of the commons. I think many of us will be familiar with that kind of, that kind of phrase. Um, 
I think what's interesting now is a, a move now towards actually valuing those ecosystems, albeit in monetary terms, which has both good and bad aspects to it, but valuing them in such a way that they can be uh, considered more important, or at least considered important in line with other types of assets, human assets, whether that be infrastructure or something like that. I mean, Willis Taz Watson's doing some amazing work in the Caribbean where we're actually using kind of parametric insurance to, to basically uh, protect and insure against coral reef damage. And so as an event occurs, uh, there's a payment out as if in the same way as damage to your house from a storm or event would actually pay out under your home policy. Um, what's interesting there is the reason that we've had to value the ecosystem. And I think in communicating the value of it, not in terms of just maybe some of its kind of softer, less tangible uh, value, which is in entirely important, don't get me wrong, but actually understanding the tangible value in terms of its ecosystem service and valuing that actually has, uh, in, in, in terms of them being able to create a, a, a wrapper of insurance around that asset, it's actually been one way that's been really important in uh, in actually raising the importance to stakeholders, to local and national government around those kind of uh, those kind of ecosystem assets. So that's certainly one dimension of it. I mean, Erin, have you got anything else you'd like to add on on the ecosystem piece? Yeah, sure. Um, so just in terms of adaptation options, then um, nature-based solutions is definitely growing in terms of popularity. We're no longer looking at adaptation options and thinking about the, the grey infrastructure, building your concrete flood wall, but we're considering other types of options as well. So to your floodplain, allowing the river to fl uh, flood, for example, and building plants with strong roots that can absorb some of that flood water. And so certainly nature is becoming part of the adaptation story. Um, and that's how the climate lens becomes always weaved into then the sustainability uh, dialogue and dimension. Exactly. And then, of course, we all know about the uh, task force. Well, many of us may know about the task force for nature related financial disclosures, which is which is coming along the tracks uh, fairly soon, which obviously will create obligations around the valuation of ecosystems. Uh, to, to um, particularly publicly listed companies, so it's obviously very relevant to brands and retailers. Um, coming off the back of the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which has been up and running since around 2017. So I think they're looking at the impacts, looking at the valuation around this is, is obviously some very important new steps forward uh, and, and hopefully, uh, for all of our sakes, hopefully raises the importance of these ecosystems uh, both to ourselves but to the to wider stakeholders and 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 general public i would like to quickly add to this if uh, it's okay so mm -hmm. i think uh, uh, you, uh the, i think as alistair also mentioned payment for e environmental or ecosystem services is not acknowledged there is no dollar value you know uh, associated with that so i think it's very important that brands and retailers support the the, the the sustainable cotton production programs in whatever capacity they can because those are the programs which focus on improving the biodiversity in that area and promoting nature-based solution you pick anything so uh, uh, you know as part of our sustainable cotton program you, uh, we uh, train the farmers to improve the or uh, you know to add more organic matter which also improves the the water holding capacity uh we you know we tell them that all insects are not bad these are the friendly insects which you know which literally eat the pest so uh that also so all these practices not only you know they improve the biodiversity or improve the local ecosystem but also have a strong business case because they reduce the cost of production from for a small grower you know they use less pesticide they use less energy they use less chemical fertilizers and we have now independent studies to demonstrate that you know these practices they make uh, you know the gross margins uh, much better than the conventional practices so i think that the, the the branded retailers should also you know keep that in mind thank you and we have lots of questions coming in the chat now and only a few minutes to answer them. Um, 
So I'm, I'm going to choose one. And uh, Hamad, I, I think I'll start with you. Um, the question is, don't we need big humanitarian provisions, even as we scale up our activity on sustainability to deal with the scale of the disaster that we saw in Pakistan? Do we have some good examples? Can you, can you give us uh, a quick take on that? So quick take is that I think the I think this is a this is a, a very valid point. the The problem is the situation is that global north still does not recognize you know its responsibility. Uh, when they committed at the Paris you know adaptation fund, they committed one billion dollars for green climate fund. How much is there? Like you know the seven eight billions. So uh, out of the hundred. So I think we need to understand that uh, in many cases, it's a humanitarian who's responsible, who, you know, got the maximum benefits of the catastrophe that we are right in, the challenges that we are facing. So I think this is the time that uh, Global North plays its role and, uh, uh, you know, recognizes its responsibility. Very lastly, it doesn't mean that the Global South does not do you know their own homework i think it's also very important that they improve the local governance the local uh, capacity uh, if they if they do not do that and just rely on global north that will also not serve the purpose Alistair, Aaron, Aaron, anything you want to add as a last word to that before we close no i think that was a great answer Hamid. thank you <laughs> thank you and uh, yeah, as one of the main messages that came out of our Cotton 2040 work, you know, uh, uh, really surfaced is that um, adaptation is social as well as environmental, which Alistair and Aaron so beautifully said. So that brings us about to the end of our masterclass uh, for today. Uh, we have a quick request before you leave. Um, we'd like to ask if you could complete a post-session survey, which will be dropped into the chat now. And there's a little trick behind this, because if you complete the survey, you get access to a handy little session summary that um, sums up the key points of today's session. Um, so a, a little uh, incentive there for you. We hope you've enjoyed today's session. Uh, and we hope you will enjoy us, uh, uh, join us for the, the next five coming up over the next few weeks. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you very much.